Hey, I'm Barry Mitchell. Welcome to Simply Science. We're at the Cradle of Aviation Museum in Garden City, Long Island for the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing mission. On July 20th, 1969, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were the first humans to set foot on the moon, while command module pilot Michael Collins looked for a parking spot. Back here on Earth, our Susan Jun found a brewery that makes beer from leftover bread. Breadweiser? Bread and beer. It's a combo made in heaven. But what about bread in beer? Now that's a different story. They're crazy. That, that would be my first reaction when somebody told me you're going to use a bunch of bread to make a beer. But that's exactly what the company Toast Al does. Brew craft beer made with bread. 1,400 pounds of bread for each brew to be exact. Basically the equivalent of one slice of bread in every can uh, or pint. And it's not just any bread, it's bread that would otherwise go in the garbage. Bread is the most wasted food in the world. Uh, in the U.S., one-third of all bread uh, is not consumed by human. High margins and short shelf life launch leftover bread from bakeries and stores into the landfill. So much of it that food shelters turn it away every single day. And that's where Toast Al steps in. Founded in 2016, the company is the brainchild of Tristram Stewart, an English environmental activist working to combat food waste. Starting his business in London and bringing it to the U.S. a year later, Toast Ale is now brewed in New York at Captain Lawrence Brewery in Elmsford. We pretty much subtract part of the malt bill, which is the amount of malt that we use in a brew, and we substitute that with bread. Um, there are fermentable sugars in bread, so we extract those out and we use those to make a final product, which is beer. Shredded bread is actually poured into the mash and soaks, allowing the sugars to start converting to alcohol. A fairly simple sounding process, unless you consider the hands-on work that goes into transporting, shredding, and then adding the bread. With 100% of Toast Al's profits going back to charity to fight food waste, the production process is a labor of love. We have been able to upcycle. If you stacked up the bread, it would be 1.5 Mount Everest. And there's no dumpster diving for this bread. Local bakeries are more than happy to donate their surplus bread. This may seem like a trendy concept, but it actually dates back to 4000 BC. And what about taste? Well, according to some, it's the best thing since sliced bread. We won awards in a blind taste test. People don't know. We have a, a craft lager, an American Pale Ale, and a an West Coast IPA, and they taste just like every other great craft beer out there. If you want to get in on the fight to reduce food waste by recycling bread into beer, Toast Al encourages home brewers to check out their recipe at toastal.com. I'm Susan Jun for Simply Science. The Billion Oyster Project is a citizen effort to rebuild the oyster reefs that once filled New York Harbor, protecting against storm surge, cleaning the water, and attracting other species. Donna Hanover has more. There were once 200,000 acres of oyster reefs in the waters of New York Harbor, and the Billion Oyster Project, based on Governor's Island, is trying to bring them back. Hatchery manager Rebecca Resner says oysters are ecosystem engineers, helping to attract many kinds of fish. They are a keystone species in our harbor. Baruch College assistant professor Stephen Gosnell says in the wild, oysters in their shells clump together. And as new babies make their own shells, the oyster reefs get bigger and bigger, which is valuable in many ways. They prevent erosion, they actually act as a wave break for storms that are coming in and help reduce those impacts. They help filter the water so the oysters feed by bringing the water in and they can cleanse the water that way. As they do that, they produce waste and that waste actually acts like a fertilizer for sediment microbes. So these microbes that are in the sediment around them and in and on their shells can actually help remove nitrogen from the water column. So there's all these different things that they do and that's why there's such an interest in restoring them here in New York. In its lab, the BOP creates the right conditions for oysters to have babies in tanks. 
They also collect oyster shells from restaurants, dry them out for about a year, and bag them to put in the tanks. Each baby attaches to a shell as an adoptive home, and then batches of them are installed in the harbor to start reefs that can then attract wild oysters. In addition, some oysters are kept in mesh bags connected to piers and measured often to find out what helps them grow. Scientists from Baruch College are part of the team. So are high school students from the New York Harbor School, guided by aquaculture teacher Roy Arezzo. Well, you need to know two things. The life cycle of the oyster, right? You're not going to put a brand new hatched out, born oyster larvae in the set tank, right? That's not a good idea. You also need to know the flow chart of the process of growing oysters alongside the BOP in this lab. Before coming to Harbor School, I didn't really understand what a dif uh, the difference an oyster could make, but now knowing that a, one teeny tiny oyster can filter 50 gallons of water a day each, then one billion could filter so many more. Look, we have a vast uh, reach of harbor, and I guess we have to start here and then we'll branch out. It's a big am impact, especially in future generations. This is gonna leave a mark and it, um, feels like I'm doing something important. BOP Executive Director Peter Malinowski says New Yorkers ate lots of oysters in earlier centuries. So they were consumed by rich and poor alike in New York City, sold from carts, and also packed into barrels, salted, and shipped all over the world. After we ate all the oysters, farmers actually imported seed oysters from points south in the Delaware Bay and the Chesapeake Bay and brought them up to plant on New York Harbor beds. And that worked until the completion of the aqueduct. And then New Yorkers had as much water as they wanted, and so they took as many showers and flushed as many toilets. And, it, and all of that wastewater went right out into the rivers. People started getting sick, and then by the early um, sort of 1900s, they closed all of the shellfish beds. The turnaround will take many years, but it is underway, and the Billion Oyster Project says they'd like your help. You can come to the island, sign up on our website, um, volunteer, and do many different kinds of tasks. We also have a citizen scientist program um, where people will have ORS cages, so oyster research stations, and they can take data and give it back to us. All along the eastern coast and into the Gulf of Mexico, there's restoration efforts. So there's definitely a nationwide and global interest in restoring these reefs. We've lost close to 80 or 90 percent of oyster reefs worldwide. So not just what's happening here in the city, we're not the only ones who have done this. It's been a common story. So there's definitely an interest in rebuilding those reefs on a global basis. I'm Don a Hanover for Simply Science. <laughs> Last time I saw my dentist, he looked at my mouth and said, you've got the deepest cavity I've ever seen, ever seen, ever seen. I said, well, you don't have to repeat yourself. He said, I didn't. That was an echo. Here's Ari Goldberg at the dentist. Going to the dentist isn't something most of us exactly look forward to. We all know we need to do it, but there are a ton of question marks around when it comes to oral care. Flossing versus mouthwash. Do whitening products really work? Is there really a difference between toothpastes? I went for a cleaning at the state-of-the-art Columbia University College of Dental Medicine to set this all straight and learn why dental hygiene can have far more implications for your health than just bad breath and yellow teeth. First things first, let's clear up some terms here. So plaque is just food buildup on the teeth. Usually there's bacteria in there as well. Plaque is your initial stage, and then ultimately it would be tartar or calculus. Tartar is usually really hard for the individual to remove at home. Whereas plaque, if you're brushing and flossing, you're able to remove yourself. Once it's solidified to your teeth, you really need a dentist or a hygienist to get it off for you. Okay, got it. Plaque and tartar are bad. But why exactly are they a problem beyond aesthetics? When there's noxious stimuli in your mouth, and there's chronic inflammation, ultimately the jawbone will deteriorate and it will rot away. And then your teeth will get loose and ultimately fall out. So it's not even the teeth that necessarily go bad, but what holds the teeth? That the plaque and tartar causing gum disease, if left untreated, can affect way more than the gums. In fact, even beyond your mouth. The research supporting the link between diabetes and periodontal disease is extremely well established and pretty much every study that's been done has shown the link and it actually goes both ways. So poor glycemic control leads to worse periodontal disease and poorly controlled periodontal disease leads to worse glycemic control. And beyond diabetes too. 
inflammation and bacterial infection in your gums is potentially worse than inflammation in say your toe or your knee because it's much closer to both your airway system and your brain. And that can lead to more complications faster than those other two more distant sites. In fact, according to some studies, there's a link between periodontal disease and colorectal illness or heart problems even, and with Alzheimer's too. Now, none of this is to be alarmist or anything. Correlated doesn't mean caused, of course, but it certainly makes this all seem much more important than just keeping your teeth looking pretty and white and free of cavities. So the question is then, what can we do better with at home? Mouthwash is not gonna mechanically debride between your teeth the same way that floss is. Um, it can help kill some bacteria. It certainly has some positive effects, but there's no substitute truly for flossing. All right, floss over mouthwash. But what about toothpaste? Cavity protection, tartar control, whitening? In terms of toothpaste that offer cavity control, any toothpaste that contains fluoride in any form will offer you cavity control. In terms of tartar control, some toothpastes are a little more abrasive than others, so they might break up the tartar a little bit better, but that seems to be more of a buzzword. The major problem with toothpaste as a whitening agent is that toothpaste is only in your mouth for two minutes, and most people at home are frankly brushing for less than two minutes at a time. That helps navigate the toothpaste aisle some. Cavity control from fluoride is great in toothpaste. The rest, a little more dubious, according to Dr. Shaw. But no matter what we do at home, it certainly seems, knowing the potential consequences now beyond appearance, a regular dental checkup is in the cards no matter how well we clean. Similar to a car needs an oil change and someone needs to get under the hood every once in a while, even if you're doing a pretty good job at home, getting someone else in there is going to be better, at least once or twice a year. From the dentist and Columbia University, I'm Ari Goldberg for Simply Science. Next, ketamine, originally developed as an anesthetic, became a popular recreational drug. Now it's being used to fight depression. Here's Mike Gilliam. For years, the party people have used the drug ketamine to get high and rock the club scene. But now instead of abusing the anesthetic, doctors are putting the drug to good use in the field of psychiatry. They've learned it's effective for treating depression. Very small doses of ketamine administered either intranasally or more often intravenously can have a very rapid impact on depression. Dr. Dan Yosefesco is the director of the Clinical Research Division at the Nathan Klein Institute for Psychiatric Research and an associate professor of psychiatry at NYU School of Medicine. He studied the use of ketamine for the last 10 years. What they discovered was a game changer. Here's why. Common antidepressants take four to six weeks to show results, and that can be a real burden on the patient. Ketamine is faster acting, much faster. People with severe forms of depression who have not responded to many other treatments would improve fairly quickly within 24 hours, which is essentially uh, amazingly rapid. The results are shocking and show great promise. Now the Food and Drug Administration has approved a nasal spray version called Spravato or Esketamine. It was really amazing to see individuals who are profoundly depressed who would be just so much better within 24 hours. And that rapid turnaround bodes well for those who are suicidal. People who are suicidal also tend to uh, experience dramatic improvement, and that includes people who are not necessarily depressed. But there's more. Ketamine infusion therapy is now recognized as a safe, fast alternative for treating postpartum depression. A lot of women prefer it over antidepressants because they can enter breast milk and be passed to the baby where ketamine does not. There are some drawbacks. People can experience a dissociative state, feeling that they're looking at self from a distance, that time is slowing down. That usually lasts about a half hour, and experts say ketamine should be administered in the doctor's office for two reasons. One, ketamine is a substance of abuse. The second reason is that ketamine can, in some select patients, trigger a temporary increase in blood pressure and heart rate, which could be dangerous and even lead to a heart attack or a stroke. 
So ketamine is just one so-called party drug that's made its way from the clubs back to the doctor's office and the treatment of patients. And there could be more in the future. I'm Mike Gilliam for Simply Science. Long before humans ever stepped into a spacesuit, dogs, chimpanzees, monkeys, turtles, even mice were our first astronauts. In fact, I think I heard NASA once sent a bunch of cows into orbit. It was the herd shot round the world. Speaking of animals, you can take your pet now to a holistic vet. Here's Ernabel DeMillo. We're at the West Village Veterinary Hospital, and this is Banjo, and this is where he gets his holistic treatments. Sure. No pet owner wants to see their dog in pain. 11-year-old Banjo was diagnosed with cancer a year ago, and his owner opted against traditional treatments. I just didn't want to have to expose him to like radiation and harsh treatments that would maybe lower his quality of life. Initially, he came because he had a mass on his back leg, and we treated him mostly with homeopathy and some Chinese herbs. These are the Chinese herbs, Four Seasons, Gynostema. And for a very, very long time, the mass was controlled. Dr. Joe Elliott is one of the few holistic veterinarians in New York City. Holistic medicine for humans has been around for ages, and now some of these same treatments are being used to help pets. Holistic veterinarian is someone who usually is also a conventional veterinarian, went to vet school like everybody else, but then started to incorporate other methods into their treatment. Methods like perhaps acupuncture, perhaps laser, perhaps chiropractic treatments. I do also homeopathy. There are many, and it may use herbs. Some people do Chinese medicine. For some pet owners who are seeking alternatives to Western medicine, she has become the go-to vet. When Memphis suddenly couldn't sit, I didn't know if he had some kind of injury or what it was, I took him to another vet that he sees and um, they couldn't find anything wrong and they just wanted to prescribe um, basically doggy Advil, which I think is called Remedil. Claudia Farzano wasn't happy with that treatment. It made him sleepy, he just wasn't himself. So I didn't like that idea. I found Dr. Jill Elliott and she's just been fabulous. He has no problem sitting. It really has made a huge difference. And I, I use chiropractic care for myself, so I just believe in the whole package. Pet care is big business in the U.S. Last year alone, Americans spent $18 billion in veterinary care and $16 billion in food and over-the-counter medicines. According to Dr. Elliott, holistic medicine is a less costly alternative, especially the natural homeopathic treatments. It's very inexpensive. The homeopathic remedies in the store, I actually have a whole cabinet full of them. Um, and the remedies come in little vials like this. And usually in most stores, they'll be eight or nine dollars. And you can buy them in Whole Foods. You can buy them in places that will sell homeopathic remedies, a lot of health food stores. While holistic vet care is popular all over the world, you won't find too many in the New York area. For many pet owners, they seek holistic treatment after all their options run out. When they reach a dead end that, you know, their dog has cancer and there's nothing more that can be done, and then they think, okay, holistic, let me call the holistic vet. Dr. Marcy Fallick has been a holistic vet for 27 years, turning to holistic treatments after her dog Annie had a bad reaction to the Lyme vaccine. Now she's a big advocate of holistic and natural treatments, from the food owners feed their pets, to vaccines, and to their medical treatment. For those who are skeptical, she recommends they do their homework first. I tell people, look, it's your dog, you do what you want. I just want to give you the facts. And as I see it, as I've lived it, and I've been doing this for so long, and I know you love your animal, I want what you want, which is to have your dog or cat live as long as they can with the best quality of life that they can. And that's why I do what I do. I'm Ernabel DeMillo for Simply Science. And now from Garden City to the Garden State, let's blast off for New Jersey, where they're making a big deal out of something very tiny. We're at Rutgers University in New Brunswick. New Jersey is famous for Springsteen, Sinatra, and now Streptomyces griseus. Streptomyces griseus is a soil bacterium that was isolated in this room in 1944, and Streptomyces produces the antibiotic Streptomycin. And joining the ranks of the state flower and state bird, Streptomyces griseus is now New Jersey's official state microbe. 
The reason that we want to have a state microbe is it goes back to this idea that a lot of the public, first off, don't really quite understand microbes. Microbe, any living organism too small to be seen with the naked eye. Microscopic. And the second off, they think that all microbes are germs. And we hate this term germ. All microbes are not bacteria either. Most microbes that impact us and are living on this planet are beneficial to humans. Like some types of lactobacillus used to make yogurt, wine, and pickles. And cyanobacteria that produce oxygen. So this whole idea of that microbes is all bad is one of the things that kind of kick-started Douglas Evely to start this campaign. Dr. Evely is a Rutgers microbiologist who dreamed of a state microbe a decade ago. We had an online campaign. The public chose Streptomyces griseus. Then came along this individual named John Warhol. Dr. Warhol is a microbiologist and author. He got a hold of people in the House and the Senate. He found sponsors of these bills. They passed overwhelmingly. Now we have a state microbe of New Jersey. So we are in the very laboratory where Selman Waxman and his students discovered streptomycin and several other antibiotic compounds. Right here. Right here. Selman Waxman was a soil microbiologist. So out of dirt came the new medicines. Selman Waxman also coined the term antibiotic. Streptomycin really, I'd say it's most famous because it's the first antimicrobial that was active against tuberculosis. It actually had a broader spectrum than penicillin alone, and again was active against microbes that penicillin was inactive against, including mycobacterium tuberculosis. Unfortunately, we are not the first state to have a state microbe. That goes to Oregon, who named Brewer's yeast as their state microbe. Our microbe has saved thousands of lives, and it's also been used as a foundation for the biotech industry as well as the pharmaceutical industry in the state of New Jersey, which has employed thousands of our relatives, our neighbors, and our friends. And we're using it as a tool to help educate children and adults about the importance of microbiology in their everyday lives. But the one thing Dr. Boyd would like you to remember... Not all microbes are bad. Over again, moreover, most microbes are good for us and the Earth. We've got our very own microbe. We've got our very own microbe. We've got our very own microbe right here in the Garden State. Summertime means sunscreen. Good for humans, bad for marine life. I never use sunscreen on my fish. I like tartar sauce. Here's Andrew Falzone in Hawaii. Hawaii? How come Falzone gets to go to Hawaii? The Hawaiian Islands are renowned for their natural beauty. Whether it's the soft sandy beaches, oceanside lava rock, a towering waterfall, or smoldering lava flows. But not all of Hawaii's treasures are accessible from land. Off the shores of its pristine beaches, the eight main islands that make up Hawaii are home to more than 410,000 acres of coral reef. Dr. Kristen Palazzato is a biologist at Kingsborough Community College in Brooklyn and explained the importance of coral reefs to the ecosystem. They cover less than 1% of the ocean floor. In fact, probably less than a tenth of a percent of the ocean floor. And yet, they're by far the most productive uh, marine ecosystems by a long shot. Coral reefs in Hawaii and around the world are essentially the foundations of the ocean. The physical structure they create provides habitat for different animals. The reefs also provide something scientists call ecosystem services which include things like filtering water, creating new soils, that sort of thing. And coral reefs are not the only system that provides them, but in the ocean, they're the major provider of ecosystem services. And because the ocean is all connected by currents, um, whatever's happening there is gonna affect the rest of the ocean to some extent. Researchers found two ingredients in most commercial sunscreens that are causing problems for coral. The chemicals are oxybenzone and octanoxate, and so as of 2021, sunscreens with those chemicals are banned from being sold or distributed in Hawaii. So the screens in the sunscreen, the active ingredients, come in two categories, organic and inorganic. And the organic ones are these type they're talking about banning because they're organic can be biologically active. 
So if organisms are exposed to them or absorb them or both, it can interfere with their biology in a number of ways. Studies show that the banned chemicals can affect the reproductive and hormonal systems of corals as well as damage DNA. In fact, only a single drop of sunscreen can affect coral in an area the size of six Olympic swimming pools. Other organisms are also affected by that, but they seem to be the most vulnerable to it. And because they're the foundation for the rest, it's important to uh, prioritize their care. And when you're in Hawaii, you don't have to look far to find a coral reef. There are many only footsteps from shore, putting them very close to sunscreen, washing off of swimmers and into the water, which is how scientists believe the vast majority of sunscreen chemicals make contact with coral. The coral, the animal, is the foundation of that whole system. If it's gone, they're all gone. So whether you're on the shores of Hawaii or at Rockaway Beach here in New York City, you might want to try using a mineral-based reef-safe sunscreen. Those are the ones with zinc or titanium dioxide as the active ingredient. The other option is to use protective clothing with an SPF rating like this rash guard. I'm Andrew Falzone for Simply Science on CUNY TV. And that's our show. Our thanks to the Cradle of Aviation Museum. And you can always check us out at tv.cuny.edu and Facebook and YouTube. I'm Barry Mitchell. See you next time on Simply Science.